Let's turn to the book of Psalms. Now we're going to look at the eighth Psalm. Psalm number eight. And we're going to read several verses here. And let's just see how far we get. Let's start with uh, the eighth. In fact, let's just read the whole Psalm. These are powerful words. Remember, we are refuting evolution as taught by Darwinism. Let's read this, please. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. You who set your glory above the heavens, out of the mouth of babes and infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? and the Son of Man, that you visit him. For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea, that pass through the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Heavenly Father, words cannot express our appreciation for you and what you mean to us and how you have uplifted us and given us such a sense of self-worth. We didn't need esteem that we earned, but thank you for that self-worth that we could never earn. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory today as you anoint me to preach and unveil these wonderful truths and then bless our hearts to receive it. We give you the praise in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said amen. amen. Lord bless you. Uh, have I told you lately that I love you? Maybe I ought to get my guitar out. Have I told you lately that I love you? I do. I can't help it. <laughs> I make no excuse. I'm not apologizing for it. Uh, but it's something that only God can do, as you know. It's easy to uh, not like people. <laughs> You know, really it is, because I lived through I don't want to go through it again, because I hate these confessions of the past. But uh, I had a whole different, I've just been revolutionized in how I feel, and I'm just so, so thankful to the Lord. Well, I, I'm speaking on a subject matter that I call God's intentions for man. God's intentions for man. Now, let me just kind of read through my introduction. I'll share some things with you I hope will bless you. When we scrutinize and examine the capacious and grand universe as we know it today in our limited knowledge, and the earth, along with all of its tremendous resources, we have to ask, why was it all created? For what intention did God go through all the trouble to create this vast, integrant expanse? We must circumspectly examine this question in the light of infrangible, inexorable, uncompromised, cogent, incisive scripture. Because that's what the Word of God is. It's so full of truth that words cannot express the content of the Word of God. The pure, unadulterated scriptures present, from my view, an impervious plan initiated by God, unveiling the solution to the dilemma is why God went through the trouble to create all of the universe. Anything less than looking into the Word of God is certainly, to say the least, my, a myop, myopic view and derelict of the knowledge of God's discernible and designed plan. When I say we refute Darwinism, I refute the premise that there is no God, that, that evolution is the answer, that chance is the answer to life. Just by chance, by some unknown circumstance, the little amoeba came on the scene. I don't know where he or she came from. Well, maybe we'll just call it an it, because there probably was no he, she's yet. But I don't know where it came from. But if I'm to believe Darwin, somehow, I don't know what happened. Maybe it was windy that day. And it blew on a little sand, a piece of sand. And that sand was tired of being a piece of sand. And it decided it wanted to move. And so it became a one cell. You know, it gets ridiculous. You do know that, don't you? And it's hard for me to believe, as a simple man, 
how people of, of the intelligence, of the intelligence, as we say, and people of higher learning can accept such a preposterous <laughs> presumption that man just happened. I refute him. You know, I, I, did, I love the universe. I love the study. I mean, I don't know. I think maybe Brother Dan Richards and I have the most love for the universe. My fellow Mensa help, you know, him, him and I are both members of the Mensa. Of Mensa. But, but he, he has a telescope, and, and he, he knows, he, 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 boy, I like to look through that telescope, because you can see up there in the heavens. But let me just tell you some things. Do you know how long it would take you to circle the Earth over 2 million miles if you traveled at the speed of, speed of light, 186,000 miles per second? 13 seconds, wow, <laughs> that'd be neat. Did you know how long it takes the furthest planet to circle the sun, Uranus? 84 years, wouldn't you get tired <laughs> waiting to get around that sun? But it only takes 365 days for 364 days and a little fraction of another day for the Earth to get around the sun. So it's very interesting. You know, if you could get a bird's eye view, if you could get up high enough and you got a bird's eye view of all the planets in the Earth, tell me why is it, Mr. Darwin, uh, why is it that they all spin counterclockwise? Now, wouldn't you think that of all, you know, we're just talking about the main planets, let's say eight planets, because I always include Pluto, poor little Pluto. They try to kick him out. They say he's a little bit too small to be a part of the planets, but I put him in there. And I think they're going to put him back in, by the way, this year. I think they're voting on it. But anyhow, if you had a bird's eye view and you were up above, you'd see all those planets spinning in a counterclockwise. Now, wouldn't you think if it was just chance that at least two or three of them would be going the other way? Wouldn't you just think that? I mean, wouldn't you think they'd get tired of loneliness? Wouldn't you think that they'd get together and maybe marry each other? Some maybe Mars and you know Neptune get together and marry each other or something? Well, I know it sounds ludicrous, and I'm not meaning to make light because I appreciate what God has created. But He's created an orderly universe. Only man, because we have a free free uh, moral agency, that means simply we have a right to choose. Only man disrupts the whole routine. I mean, what God has done, he, whatever, he's put the, you know, the sun is 93 and some odd miles, uh, 93 million and some odd miles away from Earth. And you know what 93,000 miles, 93 million miles means in astronomical terms? Because when you deal with astronomical distances, you don't deal in miles. You deal with what they call astronomical units. Each astronomical unit is over or about 90 million miles. Now think of that. The, the nearest star to Earth, the star, Proxima Centauri. That's the name of it, Proxima Centauri. It's the nearest star to Earth. You know how far it is? Four light years away. Light years, what does that mean, Brother Dave? Well, remember this. An AU, an astronomical unit, is 90 million miles. One light year is 63,000 AUs. So you've got to multiply 63,000 times 92 million to find out what a light year is. And then after you find out how much a light year is, then you've got to multiply that times four because the nearest star is four light years away. And you come up with one trillion, 256 billion miles. I'm getting tired up here thinking about it. <laughs> now, I know you're, we don't have a lot of mathematicians in here, but I, I just find it just uh, humorous that intelligent people could think that this vast universe, we only have, we live in our own galaxy. That's just one. We used to think that was it. As I mentioned to you last week, there are hundreds of galaxies. A galaxy is simply a whole crowd of maybe planets and whatever it is. And uh, they, they're existing all throughout the vast universe. Now, I'm, a, I'm about something today. You have to appreciate it. I act like an attorney up here, a defensive attorney. I'm in defense of the gospel. I get sick and tired of hearing these statements over and over again that center around a godless philosophy. It, I can't take it. I can't sit back and take it because I may offend some party, I may offend some person, and offend somebody. 
You know, I, I get so tired of hearing about global warming, and I know they got tired of it too, and they changed it to climate change. I found it interesting this week that the man who founded the Weather Channel, who has all the degrees that you can think of that a weather person would have. He has a long train of things, been around a long time. And he, they even invited him on CNN, which I was very surprised. Because you know what he took? He told his CNN audience who believe in evolution. He said, there is no global warming. <laughs> I thought, thank God for you, buddy. I'm just appreciative. You see, here's why. Folks, please, I, I'm not trying to make fun of a whole group of very fine people that, that believe that. But in order to believe in the believe that man controls the climate and it's up to us to make it livable for the next century or whatever time is left or next year or 20 years from now and so on, is a godless idea. It takes in our own hands as a man, as a woman, as a finite being, to do things that are infinite that we cannot control. You can only control a local area. That's true. Now, let me explain the weather a little bit so you know why the, the whole idea of weather, uh, of global warming and climate change is ridiculous in the way it's taught. It's because if they would make a simple study, we would know that in certain areas, not just Los Angeles, that happens to be what we call the Los Angeles Basin. And because of the mountains on one side, the ocean on one side, there is a, and because it's a basin, they have high pressure systems. That's the, that's the pressure system. We get them too, but they get a high pressure system and often it sticks. It doesn't move. Now we get it here once in a while. We call it the Bermuda High. Once in a while in the summertime, August generally, we didn't get it for the last year or two, but anyhow, a high pressure system moves down from the north. It settles in, comes down. It's very large. Sometimes pressure systems are small. This, this is very large. And it centers just south of us, maybe around Kentucky, somewhere in that area. And we call it a Bermuda High, and it stays in one place. And sometimes two weeks go by. If you have this happen, you'll remember summers where it would be 90 degrees, three or four days in a row. You'd have more 90 days in that period than the whole summer put together. And as long as that high pressure is set, it is like a lid. Now, we normally don't have smog problems here, but I can tell you one thing. When that sets in for two straight weeks and it doesn't move, it starts getting a little smoggy. You start noticing a little bit of haze in the air. Well, imagine if you lived in Los Angeles and it had the circumstances uh, that's often, not just once in a great while like we get it here. And so they have a problem where if you have a lid, then the smoke or whatever can't get out. Not because people are doing anything unusual, it's just where they're located. It's not the only place in the world, folks. You can go into China, there's several, there are several cities in China, I can't give you the name offhand, that it is so smoky you can't hardly see in the daytime at noon. And so what is so ridiculous about what they're trying to do about global warming? They're trying to put the pressure on us. Please don't use the resources in the ground. Fossil fuel, bad, oh, bad, bad, bad. Okay, they use it. They tell us not to use it because if they can get us, we, we peons, they can get us, <laughs> that's a funny word, but it's a word. But anyhow, if they can get us just rank and file folks to do it, then they can live any way they want to and use all the fossil fuels they want to, but we'll help the, you know, in the first place, it's so ludicrous because we're not the ones causing the problem. And the, you know, in the developing nations such as India and China, they're the ones developing more problem with uh, fossil fuel use and smoke and all the rest. But let me just tell you something. God is not caught by surprise. And he, if you, we trust him, it, it, he, I pray it doesn't happen, but, I, but if he should tarry and we should live, say, 100 more years, I guarantee you the, the temperature would not have fluctuated more than a degree or so up or down. Now remember, folks, I'm going to get off the subject in a moment, but I can't help it because I hear too much of the contrary. Well, well, well all these scientists, well, all, all these scientists. How about all the scientists that don't believe it? You don't listen to them. You just listen to the ones that do believe it. They have no support for it. Let me give you a simple thing, and I'm going to go on. In the 70s, later 70s, I know because I had to help clean the lot outside. Because at that time, we didn't have a nice crew like we have here. So my brother-in-law and I, Brother Hugh, was with me. He was very good with equipment. We had a backhoe. We had a big dump truck. And uh, we had a, a pickup truck with plows. And we would have to come sometimes 
in the middle of the night, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, Saturday night, get ready for Sunday and clear the snow. We had so much snow, we had to lift it up and put it over the fence toward the expressway. 75, 77, 78. You remember those, those winters? We had so much snow, you couldn't see the other lane. If you went down West Tusk, you could not see the lane because they had so much snow in the middle, you couldn't see over to the other lane, going one way or the opposite way. What did they say in the 70s? An ice age has come. <laughs> but you see, man doesn't create weather. Simple things like oceans commit. Have, have to have to do with weather. And the comets and, the, and the, all the rest of the thing that God has made has a lot to do. The moon has, a, has, has, has influence on the, on the waves of the sea, on the tides. And you could go on and on. So here's my question today. It's a very simple question because I'm a simple person. But you agree with that. <laughs> I'll get very annoyed. No. But I'm a very simple person. If God did this, and he made this vast, vast universe, and all the planets are gone counterclockwise, I don't know why, but I know God knows why. Darwin sure didn't know why there was any order, because he believes in chance. And they're taught this over and over, year after year, in, in, in institutions across the world, that this is a fact. It is not a fact. It is a philosophy. It is an opinion. It is, it is, it is speculation is all it can be because there's no proof for it. Let me give you something simple. If there really was evolution as taught by Darwin, wouldn't you think at some time that little amoeba, as it progressed, somehow multiplied itself? I don't know how because there was no one to do it. Had to do it. Boy, what a school that was. No teacher to teach it. And there it was, kept doubling and doubling and finally became a plant. Think of that. A little one-cell amoeba became a plant. Maybe a green plant. Maybe some other color. We don't know yet because we have no idea. And then he became a man. He got tired of being a plant. He became a man. Now, let me, just, let me just give you some simple logic. If that is a fact, wouldn't you think that it's somewhere down the line in that chain? Wouldn't you think we begin to see some mirror maids? Half women and half fish. Wouldn't you think we'd be able to see a half ape and a half man? They're so determined. You ought to go to the zoo. And you look at some of these monkeys or whatever it is. There's certain kinds. I'll say this is the nearest thing to man. Man, they can pick up food with their hands and they can peel a banana and eat the banana. Man, they're just like a person. How come they don't pay rent, those suckers? <laughs> How come they don't have to worry about mortgage payments? <laughs> you don't find anything in between. And the Bible says that everything was created after its kind. Now listen, if you examined all of creation, certainly man. Man mates with a, a, a woman and produces a child. Two men mating together produces just nonsense. <laughs> You say, well, how come homosexuals and how come lesbians have children? I know, but they're using somebody else's seed, somebody else's sperm, the, the crooks, they can't do it themselves. Help me, Jesus, what I say that for? <laughs> and so you create, you don't create, you don't, ha you don't get together with your wife and then create a, a, an ape. <laughs> you don't create a dog. Uh, let's get a little more, a little more, more creative. You don't create a, a porcupine. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Could you imagine birthing that? Their quills are really hard. They're like knitting needles. They can really puncture you. Well, you seem like you needed a little laugh. There's two serious people in the church. There's two people that wouldn't laugh at anything Brother Dave says. They're too serious. They think, I can't wait to get out of this church. Let me get to that church where that pastor's got a sour face and he's serious. <laughs> Amen. Well, I'm serious, and I got some good stuff here if you'll listen. I'm trying to point, it, point out something to you today. If God went through all the trouble to create this vast universe... And man has tried everything he knows to find life on every single planet that I've mentioned in the past. I didn't mention them all today, but I mean, we've sent out probes 
that have been out there 15 years. So they've been out there, and I mean, when they travel to speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, you can imagine they've traveled great distances. They've traveled, we know we've had probes on Mars and different places. We know a lot about the weather patterns, and they have searched and scrutinized these planets looking for some life. And they say, we think we saw a little ice. Maybe that would mean that sometime, somewhere, there was, oh, they're big. They just, oh, they, if one little ant would appear on one of these planets, I mean, the papers would be jammed. Every scientist in the world would be on CNN and all the rest of the stations, and they'd be telling about, oh, we found, we found life. Oh, we found life on another planet. I've been around a long time, and I've kind of followed this pretty good. We've got the Hubble telescope up there, man. It's been out there, and it's been, it's, boy, some great pictures of all these Borelluses and all these different things. And we see clusters of stars. We see them being made and all this. We see that. And we've got planetariums, my Lord, on, in Peru alone in those mountains. They've got a planetarium. You get in there and look up there, and you can see all. The, and they can look, and they know all over, but they can't find life. Now, here's my supposition as the defense attorney here. My supposition is this. If God made all this, and it's all uh -oh, spinning in a counterclockwise, don't get it wrong, counterclockwise, and the earth is on its axis, is it a thousand miles per hour on its axis, and while it's on its axis, it's in its orbit around the sun, all that's going on by accident, by way, by accident, just so happened. It started with the little amoeba, that one cell, little animal. Somehow, I'm getting tired of thinking what all this little thing did to bring all this into existence. <laughs> but why is it then, just sensibly, now I like to have fun, but let's just sensibly. Why is it God made all of these planets and, and, and all of these great a celestial beauty and we see it and we wonder about it we watch the stars at night and all the rest and he did all that life is nowhere else but on earth why is it that neptune takes 84 years to get around the earth how many know if it took 84 years to get around the sun you couldn't live there because at times it'd be so cold you'd freeze to death and at other times it'd be so hot you'd burn to death why is it that only earth's is just at the right distance, 92,136,000,000 miles away from the sun. Why is it it's just enough to keep warm enough and cold enough? See, being cold keeps you honest. You can't appreciate warmth until you get cold. That's why we have snowbirds. People that live in the east and head for the west or head for the south in the wintertime, we call them snowbirds because they can't stand the snow. But we have all this, and, it's, and only earth is habitable. So why did God make the universe? It looks like to me, now I'm a simple person. It looks like to me that the reason God made all of the universe was for earth's sake. You know, we talk about the blood moon, talk about all the eclipses and all that. But if, I mean, if you understand astronomy, you would see why. You know, it's, it's every, so, you know what has to happen to get a blood moon, by the way? By the way, the blood moon's not really blood. You do know that. It takes a, it takes a direct, it has to be perfect lineup of, of the sun, the moon, Mars, and Earth. And the sun has to hit just in a certain way that it picks up the red from Mars. Now, I'm just giving you the, 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 uh, the, 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 the what do I say, scientific explanation. You can believe anything else beyond that. I'm not trying to put that down. But, and somehow, what happens? The reflection of the tail end of the Earth and Mars comes on the sun, and it makes it look red. Isn't that something? You see, because all of the planets, now, there may be some spiritual connotation to that. I haven't got into that study. I know there's some great studies out there. Certainly, uh, se several have done it on television. We've even done it here in the church. Brother John has done it. And I don't put that down. I'm just trying to say from a, from a scientific point, that's how it happens. But we know that all the planets, they get lined up. A certain, we've heard of Halley's Comet. We, you know, most of these comets are named after people that discover them as they search the, the heavens. And But all of them seem to all minister to the earth. 
you know, the magnetic fields and all the things that, you know, there's too much to even consider. And I don't want to try to, you know, I know enough to be dangerous. I don't know, you know, know enough to be, be intelligent about it. But I just know enough to be dangerous just to, to know how everything operates. And everything points to earth. There's no other living thing in the whole universe. Now, since earth seems to be the reason for God's creation... And the fact that it's livable and man is the only thing along with his pets and animals and so on and things he eats, the fish and the birds and all the rest, only man can survive on earth. Now think about this if you look at it in order. God created this vast universe and of all of our study we can't prove there's life anywhere else but earth. Earth is the only livable planet. You could go any other planet. They're wonderful. You can study about them. They have moons around them. It's just fabulous. Saturn has several moons. I mean, if you see them through the telescope, they're beautiful to look at. But there's nobody lives there. Not because they don't want to. We've got some nut brains in this world that have the money. If they thought they could live on Saturn and there was life there, they would take a jettison out of here and they'd travel 100. They didn't care it's 186,000 miles per second. Can you imagine the force that would be? <laughs> I mean, your eyeballs would kind of roll back. I don't know. But the mystery of the universe is unveiled. Think of this, because I want to build this case. Enough metal in the ground, iron ore. Man didn't make metal. He had the iron ore. He could work with it. He could make different shapes out of it. But ore comes from the ground. And it was enough to build the vast rail lines that still operate, by the way. Still operate back and forth and help move commerce and important things, such as oil, for instance, moved. A lot of that is moved in these great tankers that go by rail lines. How about the airplanes, automobiles, enough oil to run the engines? and provide the base for all sorts of plastic. When you use your toothpaste, if it's a plastic tube, it comes from oil, folks. It comes from oil that's mined out of the ground. And no doubt other resources that are yet undiscovered. Do you know in the vegetable kingdom alone there are 183 varieties of, of the eucalyptus family alone? 183 varieties of one species? And these along with the oak that probably lives the longest of any tree. And do you know the oak tree has a, a leaves that last longer than any other tree when it reaches wintertime? I know you're still raking leaves on January 18th. <laughs> <laughs> the sign pine. Look at the pine. Listen, I don't know if you noticed lately, but they've been erecting larger telephone poles. You know, your normal poles, whatever, you know, Brother Shelton could tell us how much they were, you know, what they were, 30, 40, 50, 60 feet, whatever they were, and they'd be so high. I don't know if you notice now, I can't even imagine. They look like they're about 300 feet tall to me. I mean, they're, they're on the ground, I see them, and they're lifting these poles and putting them in the ground and lifting up because there's so much electric. The grid is so enlarged, and there's so much need for electricity. Imagine those, man didn't make that. Maybe Hillary was right, man didn't make that make that pine tree. He may have made his business, by the way, but he didn't make his pine tree. I mean, really, and these tall, erect pine trees are used to put telephone poles. Imagine that. How about the laughing maple? The maple is one of the first ones to lose its leaves, but it's very beautiful. The delicate willow, willow in the windstorm, you've heard of that. And by the way, along with the oak, they're the first ones to start turning yellow and then green in the spring. And they're the last ones, probably beyond the oak, the oak, <laughs> to stay green and keep swinging in the air. The lonely poplar. They were created to fill the need in humanity's development. Think where we'd be if we didn't have wood. What if we didn't have wood? How would you build a house without wood? You say, well, well we'd build them out of steel, uh, two by fours. Okay, but where did you get the steel? Oh, that came from ore. Where'd the ore come from? In the ground. Who put it there? Oh, help me, Jesus. <laughs> I begin to lose my voice after a while. Think about this. And there are over 100,000 classified varieties in the vegetable kingdom. Brother Dave's narrow. Peppers, tomatoes, cucumbers, basil, <laughs> parsley, <laughs> oregano, and what I say? That's about it for my garden. 
Well, imagine how little and skinny my garden is compared to God's. My Lord, think about it. 100,000 classified varieties in the vegetable kingdom. And there are 500,000 insects that feed on these varieties, and each of them have a purpose. You may not like them, but they have a purpose. God loves them. He made them. If the earth is the reason for the heavens and man is the reason for earth, what is the reason for man? Boy, if you read through the Old Testament, I, you know, these kinds of things, you take two or three hours to really get, get into your head a little bit with this. But when you just think about it, it, it's just enough to, when you realize that you, as a human being, see, this would take away all depression. This would take away all sense of not being needed. Nobody cares about me. I might as well kill myself. If you knew how many times we have to hear that, it would make you sad. How many people say, I mean, you hear people say this. I hear them, and I know they have the, the, they have the armament to do it. I mean, when someone tells you right to your face, Brother Dave, I felt like taking my 357 and placing it right on the temple of my brain and blowing my brains out. Now, that's a pretty serious way to die. It may be instantaneous. The nerve that it would take to lift up a loaded... You wouldn't have to be a three. A 22 would do it. You put it in the right place. And yet people feel, they, why do people, they come up against problems and circumstances they can't deal with. It may be in their marriage. It may be in their job. It may be in their business. It may seem like everything's falling apart. And so they feel like they're, 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 they're not worth anything. They have no ability to survive. And they don't want to. It's too much. It's overwhelming. All you have to do is think this how much God thought of you, the trouble he went through to make it possible for you to have dexterity, be able to walk and have, hopefully you walk in the right direction. Breathe, them two lungs bringing in the air so it can oxygenate your blood. Blood flowing through your veins, 60,000 miles of blood veins was going through like that. Brain cells that can comprehend neurotransmitters going back and forth like you see a computer or a typewriter used to be look like. So that you're, so that you're coordinated. When you, when you say, I want to lift my arm, you can lift your arm. Muscles that not only give you the strength to lift your arm or lift something, but also muscles that hold back so that you don't come and sock yourself in the face. Amen. While I'm pulling, other muscles are pulling back just right so that I can lift it at any speed I want. Drink my coffee. Praise God. Decaffeinated. I don't care what kind. I never knew the difference between decaffeinated and caffeinated. I don't know that there's any help in one way or another. I don't want to destroy your ideas about the can Just drink it. That's okay. Just don't drink more than one cup a day. That's all. But imagine if you picked up your cup or whatever. Maybe you had been to. Maybe you've been to Starbucks, so you don't have, you have a paper cup. That's cheap, scapes. Charge you an, <laughs> charge you, my God. We're having the old nickel cup of coffee, my God. And that's in paper. Man, you had to watch how you pick up your squeeze too much. It's coming out <laughs> of its own core. And imagine if you didn't have that coordination, if God didn't put it there. See, God's a God of order. He made you so you have order. I know there are diseases and, and genetic problems that can cause otherwise. But normally speaking, as you pick that cup up, you have the muscles to lift it just the right speed. Because if you lift it too fast, you dump it. And you have enough muscles holding you back so that you don't hit your face with the whole thing. I don't know if it's, don't have to be Starbucks. Not us, Brother Dave. We go to Dunkin' Donuts and get all right. <laughs> I'm not against it. <laughs> we are a fun bunch, I'm going to tell you for sure. We really are. So if the earth is the reason for heavens, then man is the reason for earth. And what is the reason for man? Now, there's only one answer. Let's go to Ephesians 4, 6. Now, I know I haven't used a lot of Scripture because some of these kind of messages, we have to build a case. There's certainly enough Scripture to support it all. Look at this. One God, not one amoeba. Not one, I, one chance. Like I said, boy, it's a chance. One in a million. What is it for the lottery? One in 178. No, one in 78 million chance. Do you like the big lotto? Oh, Brother David's up to $300 million. 
and I'm going to buy 10 tickets that will give me 10 more chances than one? Your chances are exactly 1 in 78 million. But it'll be me. I know there's a lot of it'll be me's all across the country. You ought to see how people pray to win the lottery. God says, oh, no, not again. He makes him so tired when it reaches over $300 million because, oh, everybody starts praying. The people get so religious. Uh, uh, there. <laughs> it's too bad. I lived, I see, I lived, you see, one good thing about living a long time, you know more than you should. <laughs> now, listen. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Come on, give him a praise. It is John 3.16 that grips our heart with a, the with a love that no one else could have but him. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Isn't that fantastic? God and angels, he had sent angels to minister to us. And also, we have to think of this, he had angels ministering to him. Why wasn't he satisfied with just the angels ministering to him? They were like a great big choir up there. Satan, before his fall, was the star of the morning, Lucifer. He was up there leading these great choirs, and God was blessed by music long before we came on the scene. Why didn't he just stay satisfied with that? It was because he wanted children. He Just like some of you, we got married and you wanted a baby. Almost every woman in the face of the earth wanted a baby. Some of us not as fortunate as others as far as having Child, children, but generally speaking, people want a child. They want offspring. They want their protege to, to go on. So he wanted children, sons and daughters, who would choose to serve him. Listen, if you want to know something about God's character, this shows you something. If you go back from the time of before creation. Now, remember this. It says that Jesus was crucified before the foundation of the world. What do you think that means? It means that God knew full well. When he created man, what he was up against. He knew what man was going to do. God yearned for men, women. I'm talking about the human race. Who would want him? God didn't want to force anybody. He wanted us to want him. He wanted us to love him. He wanted us to love him. And that was his great yearning. Obviously, the angels didn't satisfy that. They were just created beings. They didn't have a will in the matter. Now, it's true that uh, when Satan sinned there, I showed something. He was deciding to overrule God, but it was limited compared to what man has. We're creatures of choice. <clears throat> and God wanted us, creatures of choice, to want him. And so he also wanted a chosen people. Now, all of you don't agree. Some people try to reason with me. The Jews are not God's chosen people. Oh, brother, and, you know, if, if you get around Jehovah Witness, you'll get all this stuff. Some other denominations, they, they, you get this stuff. Well, they, 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 the ten lost tribes, after all, they got, a, they got a, amalgamated into England, and so they, that's what we call British is, right? I don't get me tired with all this stuff here. If they're all lost, how come when God, in the end time, calls out 12,000 out of each tribe, he knows where they're at? 144,000, it's mentioned in the book of Revelation. God calls them out. He knows where they're at. Doesn't say anything about England. Uh, you have to be in theology a little bit to get a kick out of some of this stuff. Some of this stuff, I just laugh about it. I just can't help it. God took a very long time to prepare heaven and earth for man. If this is true, there must be a very special place in God's heart for man. Psalm chapter 8. I'm almost done. <clears throat> what is man? See, when you analyze the man's inhumanity to man, it's hard to figure out why God ever put up with man. We're characters. We are a mess. That's why he had to send Jesus to the cross. There's no other way. If there was another way, he'd have done it. What is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower. And if you looked at that translation, it doesn't mean that we're, angels are above us. It just means a little bit lower. It, there, there's a connotation. I don't want to get into it. Now it's too much to get into. But it doesn't mean that. It means really when you look at this, we're right next to God. God created man in his image. We're right next to him. Then angels, actually. But a little lower than the angels in, in one physical sense. And you have crowned him, who? Man, with glory and honor. 
You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, and sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field. Think about it. And the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. Fish don't fish you. You fish fish. Birds don't shoot you. You shoot birds. <laughs> and pass through all the paths of the sea. Oh, my. This is pretty much here. How about Ephesians 1, 18 through 23? Now, watch who we are. I'm trying to drive a point. I wish you'd get it. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. That's what we're trying to do with the word. That you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Which is what? Go on. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us? Why? Who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ. Gave him a name above every name. When he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all, principality and power and might, he's bragging on his son Jesus. And dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his, all things under the feet of Jesus. And gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Those are individual members of the human race. We have such value in the eyes of God that he chose us to represent him. Oh, my Lord, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills us all in all. Oh, Lord, may the Lord add his richest blessing to the preaching of the word. Hallelujah to the name of Jesus. You know, I just have to pardon my consternation sometime when I try to evaluate what our higher schools of learning have directed people in their minds. It's just so pathetic, I can hardly take it. Well, if you knew the history of America, you would know that <clears throat> almost every college, you name them, Yale, Harvard, you could go down the list, William and Mary, you go down the list, all of, these, all of these major colleges, they were founded by Christian churches like Trinity, a church like ours would found it. And the presidents of these early colleges were men who were born again, who knew Jesus Christ as Lord of their life. We can give you the names of them. Sometime I do it on the 4th of July when I tell about the history of America. And we can find this all out. We've strayed far from God. And yet we say, why this and why that? I can tell you one thing. We've slapped God in the face. We've insulted him. We've humiliated him. We made him look like he's second class. We can't even talk to our service man if we're counseling with him and name the name of Jesus because the name of Jesus somehow will cause Ebola or something. I'm telling you. And I believe, I believe people are waking up and, and the church is coming alive. You know what I've seen recently, by the way? You know, for a while, way back, back in history, churches used to have the right, a pastor had the right to speak to his people politically, take his stand, recommend, and so on. And as you know, for a long time, man has not, been, church has not been able to do that. And so in the year 2000, 78 churches decided to defy that law, and they went ahead and did what they always did anyhow, recommended their people, whatever it was. You know how many churches did it this time? 2,300 churches. And you know, what they, you know what the IRS has decided? To put it on the back burner. They're not doing anything about it. Because this is America. Of the people, by the people, for the people. And there shall be no law made in regard to religion nor the free exercise thereof. And I think we're finally starting to believe it. Come on, stand on your feet. Little political insight don't help hurt you at all. Father, in Jesus' name, it's just amazing as we watch you work and as we begin to understand why you did what you did. You knew that, that, you knew that the Jews would be hard-necked and stiff-necked, as you called them, and stubborn. And you knew there would be times when they would go back to idols and worship the Baals and the high places. And, Lord, then you would anoint somebody, and they'd come on the scene, and they'd rule for a while, and they'd burn up all the high places and the Baals and go back to doing what they ought to do. And, Lord, you saw it up and down, up and down through all the years. And yet, because you love them and you call them to be your people, you have sustained them. Lord, they're the enemies of almost every nation in the world except for perhaps the West. 
It's amazing how you preserve little old Israel the size of New Jersey. One billion Arabs surround Israel, hate them from the Gaza Strip, which is right just next door to them, and to all the other countries, including Syria and Iran and Iraq and all the other countries that blame Israel for all the trouble that's in the world today. But Lord, you love Israel, and no one's going to expunge them from the face of the earth because you love them. And your love is, it is inexorable, infrangible. You cannot defeat that love because it's unconditional. And Lord, by the same token, because of Israel turning from you, you came to us, the Gentiles, and we have accepted you. And Lord, you're our God. And you look to us. You love us. And Lord, you're, you're reconciling. That's why Jesus came to the cross. He reconciled Jew and Gentile, people of all races and ethnicity. We become one in Christ if we'll allow it to happen. Father, I speak to people today, and I pray that those who don't know Jesus will accept you today. I pray that somehow by a miracle they will turn from their sin, realize that they're the reason you made earth, so that they could live, so that they could have the opportunity to decide. I pray they'll make the right decision. Oh, Holy Spirit, convict, draw people, draw them. I know I can't do it. If I could, Lord, just without a persuasion, I would do it. But, Lord, I'm depending on you, the Holy Spirit. Touch hearts. They're tender today. The Word has been preached. Logic from the Word has come forth. Reason for existence has come forth. Help them to know that they could be eternally lost if they don't make the right decision to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, to acknowledge Him as the Creator, not some happenstance, some chance of some kind. Oh God, do what you do, and only you can draw people in Jesus' name. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, they're going to sing just as I am. Thank you for being patient. Many of you are. You wait to the very end because you know we're doing very important business at the end of a service. We're making an appeal to people around the world. You say, what good does it do? I just got these interesting statistics. I had some, but I, I only had this, how many a day? Remember I told you 16,000 Muslims are receiving Christ a day. You know what the new figure is? Six million every year. Six million Muslims every year are turning to Christ and receiving Jesus. It's worth it. It's hard. You put your life on the line. It's true. But as we reach out to them and we give them an alternative, they don't know there's an alternative. They've been following this false God for so long, they don't know there's a real God. Brother Anthony can tell you because we answer the letters that come from a prisoner. We've watched one Muslim prisoner as he begins to evolve. And we so convinced him he was, of course, a true Muslim. And we convinced him as it goes along. Now then, when he writes the letter, he says, I come to you in the name of Allah and Jehovah. <laughs> Well, we were teaching him that it's not one and the same. <laughs> but it's a wonderful thing to watch the progress. So we're making that appeal to people around the world. Pray with me as they sing, just as I am. got to have your cigarette before you even eat and you go through your life and you trip and fall and stub your toe and go through life and think it's the end as long as you can do this or you can have something to satisfy the flesh this is more to it your life's at stake your spirit is at stake except a man be born again he cannot see the kingdom of God you have to come to grips with that you're, if you don't have Christ you're lost he that believeth not is condemned already I have to preach it with his passion I cannot Go to sleep at night if I don't do it. Because lives are hanging in the balance. I'm going to have them sing one more time. The reason we sing the second time is because we're believing the Holy Spirit is cultivating, digging. And hopefully the conviction will make you realize that if you don't accept Jesus, 
you're hopelessly lost. Don't be like the one character I was talking to the other day. He said, Brother Dave, there is no hell. <laughs> Wait till you get there. Then tell me what it is. Just as I am. watching this program in some prison, maybe a federal prison, you may, be, you may have a long sentence. It's sad. We had one kid write to us. I think he was 29. I call him a kid, 29. He had already served 10 years. He said, Brother Dave, I only have 20 more to go. <coughs> 20 more to go. But even those in the prison, while they don't maybe have hope that they're going to be released from the behind bars, but when Jesus comes in your heart, you would have to read their letters for yourself. They can quote more Bible than I can. They've come to know Jesus. And I'm going to ask people like them. I'm going to ask Muslims, Hindus, Toas, Buddhists, Catholics, Christians. If you haven't already received Jesus, all you have is a form of godliness, but you've denied the power thereof. Whoever you are, maybe a new ager, you may be an atheist. This would be a good day to change from being an atheist to a believer. See, I'm a Darwinianist. I don't know if there's a word like that. But it's time to start believing that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That makes more sense. It takes a lot less faith. All right, we're going to pray. So we're going to thank God for these that have come. But around the world, I'm confident through my heart, in my, in my heart, that there are hundreds and hundreds, perhaps thousands. We don't really know until we get to heaven how many. But I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer. Now, you that are our Christian, you just reaffirm your faith. We won't hurt you to do that. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus, and I ask you, forgive me of all my sins. Wash me in the precious blood, the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross for the remission of my sins. The best I know, Lord, I receive you. I open my heart. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. I now confess that Jesus Christ is my Savior and He's Lord of my life. In Christ's name. Let me pray. Father, thank you for these that have come to the altar here in our headquarters building. But Lord, wherever people around the world have prayed this simple prayer, I pray this will be the beginning. It's just the doorway to get in. And I pray that you'll send other Christians and believers in their path or perhaps they can continue to watch us through some dish or, Lord, they can watch us, watch us through the online or however they get us. We pray for them that they'll grow in the Lord. And I pray for their safety. And, Father, I would be remiss if I didn't pray for the safety of Jews and Christians around the world persecuted. Lord, you promised the Jews they'd be hated of all nations and it's come to pass. And, Lord, we Christians who defend the Jews, we especially evangelical Christians are paying the price. Lord, around the world being persecuted, churches being burned, hundreds and hundreds being killed, treated as animals. Oh, God, help people everywhere. Preserve Christians wherever they may be. Protect them, I ask. Angels of God, go to work protecting them, I pray. In Jesus' precious name. Take a few minutes, those of you that came to the altar, take a moment. We want to give you some literature and help you. And uh, before I dismiss you, remember there are slabs of delicious ribs. Oh, with that good sauce on it. Right in the back. Go to your left instead of your right. It'll be your, it'll be your meal. And it's, it helps support the youth ministries, as you know. Hey, you really don't have any trouble. All you need is to eat some ribs. No. All you need is faith. <laughs> Faith in God, because faith in God moves. And another thing, the Lord has blessed us real good. See you in the lobby if you, if you don't go so fast.